Hello everyone, welcome to MindBrain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here, in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand and for you to learn more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today's video is focused on neurodevelopmental and neurocognitive disorders according to the SM5. So, if you're curious about how the SM5 rearranged these two categories, this is a video right for you. This is just a brief descriptive video, therefore, I will not detail specific criteria for each disorder, okay? But in the future, I will make some different videos where I will look specific to diagnostic criteria of each disorder, okay? So now let's see how the SM5 rearranged these two uh, clusters of neurodevelopmental and neurocognitive disorders. According to the SM5, neurodevelopmental disorders are a group of conditions with onset in the developmental period. The disorders typically manifest early in development, often before the child enters the grade school and are characterized by developmental deficits that produce impairments on personal, social, academic or occupational functioning. The range of developmental deficits varies from very specific limitations of learning or control of executive functions to global impairments of social skills or intelligence. So, the first category is intellectual disabilities, which encompass intellectual disability, global developmental delay, and unspecified intellectual disability. We have communication disorders, language disorder, speech sound disorder, childhood onset fluency disorder, social communication disorder, and unspecified communication disorder. Another category is autism spectrum disorder, which is a new category. Uh, in DSM-5, the category of Asperger disorder was mixed with uh, autism disorder and then uh, this category was developed, which is the autism spectrum disorders. And individuals may be diagnosed from mild to severe autism spectrum disorder. But uh, I will describe this in the future videos, okay? So another category is attention deficit and hyperactivity disorders, which encompass attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, which is the most common, other specified attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, and unspecified attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Here we may also specify that there is a predomination in attention deficit or in hyperactivity, but we will see this in the future. So another two categories are specific learning disorder and motor disorders. And in specific learning disorders, we have language disorder, mathematics, and in motor disorders, we have developmental coordination disorder and stereotypic movement disorder. We also have tic disorders, which encompass Tourette's disorder, persistent motor or vocal tic disorder, provisional tic disorder, other specific tic disorder, and unspecified tic disorder. We also have other developmental disorders, which are other specified neurodevelopmental disorder and unspecified neurodevelopmental disorder. In many diagnostic criteria, here in the SM5, you may specify the intensity or the severity of each disorder. So, typically we can describe each disorder from mild, moderate, severe or profound. But in the future, we will take a deep look on this specific criteria, okay? So now let's see the neurocognitive disorders according to SM5. So, according to SM5, neurocognitive disorders, previously known as dementia, begin with delirium, followed by the syndromes of major neurocognitive disorders and mild cognitive disorders. 
The neurocognitive disorders that were previously referred as dementia here in DSM-5 begin with delirium followed by other syndromes. The neurocognitive category encompasses the group of disorders in which the primary clinical deficit is in cognitive function and that are acquired rather than developmental, so individuals acquire this type of disorders. Although cognitive deficits are present in many, if not all, mental disorders, however, only disorders whose core features are cognitive are included in the neurocognitive category. So, the neurocognitive disorders are those in which impaired cognition has not been present since birth or very early life, and thus represents a decline from a previously attained level of functioning. So, individuals acquire this type of disorders and then they start to have impairments in uh, global functioning. The first is delirium, which may be substance intoxication or withdrawal delirium, medication induced delirium, delirium due to another medical condition, delirium due to multiple etiologies, other specified delirium, and unspecified delirium. So, now let's look to the major and mild neurocognitive disorders. The first is Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal disease, levy body disease, vascular disease, traumatic brain injury, substance or medication use, AIDS infection, prion disease, Parkinson disease, Huntington disease, another medical condition, and multiple etiologies or unspecified disease. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme to see the manual that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing here, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Welcome to MindBrain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand and for you to learn something more about it. All research here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today we will talk about the information processing paradigm. We will look to the major models that shape this paradigm and we will look how this paradigm has some impacts in cognitive psychology. But first, let's look to the manual that I recommend to you. The first is Cognitive Psychology, a student's handbook. The second is Cognitive Psychology and its implications. And the third is an introduction to cognitive science. And now, let's see what is the information processing paradigm. So, the first half of the 20th century was ruled by behaviorism, and the mind was viewed as a black box. However, around the 1950s, computers gave new ideas to psychologists to conceptualize mental processes. So, this was an approach that helped psychologists to conceptualize the mental processes beyond the black box metaphor. So, we are looking to a new metaphor, which is a metaphor that describes the mind as a set of processes such as attention, perception or memory. The mind was compared to how computers process information. So, some main examples may be attention and perception, may be related to inputting information into a computer. Or memory, may be similar to the computer storage. 
So cognitive psychology was very, very influenced by this theory and cognitive psychology starts to get focused on how individuals process information in different cognitive processes such as memory, attention, decision-making or perception. So cognitive psychology was focused on the flow of information through different stages of the cognitive processing. And cognitive psychology starts to get focused on how individuals select, store and ret retrieve memories. So, this shows how cognitive psychology was influenced by uh, the information processing paradigm. So, now let's move to some influential models that shaped cognitive psychology. George Miller in Information Processing Theory, which states that human mind performs operations that change information, form and content, stores and locates that information and gives some output based on that transformed information. This means that the human mind has some uh, operations that changes the information and then produces some output that is based on the transformed information. So humans gather and represent information, we are talking about the encoding process, and hold information in memory, which may be called retention process, and get access to that information, which can be defined as the retrieval process of that information. So, Atkinson and Schifrin's also developed the stage theory, which uh, described how information is stored in memory through a linear process. So, they stated that these processes have three stages. Information first gets to the sensory memory, then passes to the short-term memory or the working memory, and then is uh, encoded and retrieved and is retained in the long-term memory, which may be differentiated in decorative or procedural. But we will talk this in the future, okay? This is just a brief look on the information processing paradigm. So another model is the Craig and Lockhart level of processing model which is also a very important model in this paradigm. They stated that the elaboration of information in memory may take different levels from the surface level to a deeper level. The first level we can find perception, below we can see intention, and then we can look to labeling information, and then we look to the meaning attribution, okay? When we start to attribute meaning to the information or meaning to the events, it means that we are getting to a deeper level of the information processing. Another influential model was a model proposed by Rumblehart and McLellan. They stated that information is processed by multiple parts of the cognitive system at the same time. So this model stated that information may be processed in multiple parts of the brain, in the multiple parts of the cognitive system, in a parallel fashion. So, the information is stored in different parts of the brain, which are connected through a wide network of neurons. Some notions may also be important to retain, however, I will not focus uh, specifically on these notions, ok? In cognitive psychology, we tend to look to linear and parallel processing, because information may follow a sequence of events, however, uh, information may also be processed in a parallel fashion based on connectionist models. Information processing may also follow a bottom-up or top-down processing, which means that information may be triggered by the environment or the information may start the processing by inner stimuli, ok? But we will talk this in the future, don't worry. And another established notion of the processing of information is that if processing of information and cognitive development are tied. So individuals in earlier ages may have some type of cognitive processing and individuals in the later ages have different types of cognitive processing. But don't worry, we can talk about this in the future and we will look to the Piaget model which states exactly these things, ok? But we will look to this in the future. So now let's just summarize the contents of today. So in the middle of the 20th century mind was viewed as a black box. Uh, the information processing theory and cognitive psychology are mixed together, so cognitive psychology absorbed the information processing paradigm and this paradigm shaped how cognitive psychology starts to look to the mental processes. So, cognitive psychology may resemble of different models that may be defined as linear models and cognitive psychology may also rely on connectionist models. 
Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme in order to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing here, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your thoughts and to express your mind about all the concepts and all the theories that are discussed here. Let me know what you think about all of this. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!